You're listening to the Waypoint TV Podcast Network, brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Midway USA brand product designers have one straightforward goal, develop high-quality, technically sound products, and deliver them to customers at reasonable prices. If you are immersed in the shooting sports industry and pay close attention to every single detail, you know our products are built right and stand up to everyday use. Who has shooting mats and range bag systems to hunting clothing and just about everything for the outdoors? Log on and shop 24-7 with super fast shipping. MidwayUSA.com Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I'd only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at midmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. Knives, machetes, saws, and shears. Multi-tools, shovels, swords, axes, spears, hatchets, and tomahawks. If it cuts, snips, slices, or chops, Midway USA has it. Find great gift ideas in our huge selection of pocket knives and other everyday carry folding knives. Make a statement or create a family legacy with one of our top-of-the-line hunting knives. We've got a great selection of manual and electric sharpeners, too. For just about everything for the outdoors, check out MidwayUSA.com. All right, guys, welcome back to episode 264. We kick it back with the boys Brian and Tyler from Woods. What is it? Williams Woods and Water. I dude, www. Uh, What is it? WWW. WWW. Yeah, well, huh? I love it. This is your boy East Coast Trev, and I'm joined with the madman himself. What's up, dude? What is good? I tell you what, man. You know what is good is that we have temperature breaks. It was a high of 55 here in Connecticut today, and I will tell you that that means the deer season is right around the corner. It doesn't get no better than this. And we're getting daylight in bucks on camera. Yes, there will be some some good bucks are going to die this weekend for oh, sure. For sure. For sure. No questions asked there. And with that being said, I mean, I think we're still a solid week and a half, two weeks from like prime time scrape activity and, and all that good stuff. But it, it doesn't matter when you get a weather break and a temperature drop like we're, we're getting and about to have this weekend. Um, yeah, stuff's going to die for sure. It's definitely going to be good. I mean, the, the deer are definitely on their feet, out cruising, moving. Um, you know, it, it's it's nuts is that those acorns are just so prevalent, and you can see it. Like, if you have a camera in one area and they're hitting those acorns hard, you're getting them on camera every single day. And then when they switch to another area, it's like a light switch, and things just go right off. And it's like, it's so frustrating because, like, you put in all that work, time, and effort – and, like, they switched that food source. And, you know, like, you did something this past weekend, which I'm about to do in the next couple of days here, is, like, literally just hardcore scout and move to find that food source again. Because <laughs> it's no different than going and traveling and hunting public and being mobile, right? I mean, like, it's one of those things, like, you think that you're on them, and then when something changes, you got to go and find them. It's no point in them things soaking. We're 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 a couple weeks away from hardcore rutting action, like where we need to be on the X. And if you're not on it, it's it's definitely time to find it. Yeah, and bumper crop acorn year is is terrible. <laughs> like it's the hardest thing ever. You know, like there's just mm-hmm. food everywhere. There's food dropping in their beds. Like they don't have to go anywhere if they don't want to outside the rut. You know. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I, that's the first time I've ever done that. Like, I gave up an evening sit Sunday night. I was going to mm-hmm. go bump, bump on a piece of private just to just to throw a sit at it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to, like, why? Well, like, what, what am I going to gain from just a sit, just to sit? And I just uh, burned the afternoon just scouting a piece. of. It's a new piece of public to me. It's It's quite a big chunk. I don't know it that well. I want to get to know it better. So I just, I spent that afternoon scouting instead of hunting and I'm glad I do, but I, I did, uh, what is this thing that, let me tell you something right now here, buddy. Let me, let me, uh, let me get these bad boys out real quick. Cause let me tell you what rattles my antlers. I found a new food source. Hmm. I, I uh, I wanted, I had an extra cell cam. 
and I've been waiting for, you know, figure out where I was going to put it. And I, I had a good idea where I was going to drop it. A new food source, like a poacher food source or like, oh, yes, buddy. Oh. I found a cell camera two feet off the ground in the dumbest spot. It, like it's on, there's like, there's a good travel court. Like you call it like a, like a bench, right? It's off to the side of the bench where the elevation drop, like on a dead end. Like there's no reason mm-hmm. for it to wander over there at all. Like it's almost like the guy was hiding the camera, and then in front of the camera, there's just a pile of mold on the ground, which is one thousand percent from dumping some kind of foreign substance on the ground in front of the camera. It got rained on and turned to mold. So, you know, that kind of irritated me because this is, you know, not far from an area that I'm really looking forward to um, putting some time in this rut, you know, right. and. You know, I kind of, I was hoping that camera was on video because I, I kind of gave him a little speech. Um, hopefully he got the message. You know, it's, it's one of those things and it's, it's frustrating because, you know, a couple of years ago I went through something equivalent to it where, you know, you scouted real hard and e-scouted and, you know, you're like, you want to go into a place. And, and at this time, you know, it was like that. The beginning of me like really diving into the whole mobile hunting, I had a climber at the time and I would go into public land in like areas I think that I would want to go into. And this is the backside of a cut, you know, just picture perfect downwind side, like just just one of those spots that like, you know, is going to produce. There's some grass fields earlier in the season. You get in there and I go and I sit this actually I set up in a tree. I didn't even realize it. I set up in a tree. And I looked down, and there's a log, and on the other side of the log was the yellow was the yellow railroad dude across. Come the, on. I'm talking 100 150 pounds of corn. So I did my due diligence at the time. A really good friend of mine was a game warden. I called him up, and I'm like, "Hey, man, this is the deal. This is where I'm hunting. This is what's going on. I'm in here right now. If anybody comes in here." Like, I'm walking my way out, and, you know, but this is where this is at. Because I didn't, you know, at that, and it ruined my entire hunt because I had to get down. Because if I was to get caught in there, like, that's on me, right? You know what I'm saying? So I got down, and it was not that this has anything to do with anything, but they were an out-of-stater, husband and wife, and they were. Huh? How'd you find out? They got arrested. Oh, they got. They They found them. They found them. They came in, they set them up on a sting, they got them. Um, I had it, at, that's actually not the first time that this has happened. This is, that was, that was, uh, that was the first time it happened, but I had it happen again on a second occasion. Just had gotten private land permission. I asked the guy, I said, uh, to the landowner, I said, is anybody else hunting here? No, nobody else is hunting here. Oh, okay, cool. So I go and I scout the property. There was a tree stand on there. And, um, a couple days later, I'm like, oh, sweet. I'm going to, maybe I'll go check this place out. There's a tree stand on there. I says, you know, I didn't really have much other places to go. So I'm like, screw it. I said, I'm going to go and jump in on this tree stand. I go and jump in this tree stand, Steve. And let me tell you what, the sun came up and I look out and it literally was a cornfield in the woods. It was just yellow, bro. I'm talking four, five, six bags of corn all on the ground. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Nobody's else supposed to be here. So same thing. Call the game warden. Hey, man, this is what's up. I just got this place. I'm hunting here. This is what happened. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, they've been trying to catch this guy. They knew his corn piles were in there. He's like, I know those guys' corn pile was in there. I couldn't figure out where he was entering from. He was illegally hunting on the property, and they knew it. They had been checking that stand regularly, so potentially I could have been in that stand the day that they checked that stand, and they couldn't figure out where he was coming in from. I told him right where his stand was and kind of was like, well, he ain't coming in from here. He's potentially coming in from a neighboring property. Sure than shit, dude. That's where he was coming in from, and they bagged him. Uh, Out of stater. That's a Rhode Island boy. Uh, mm. coming into state and just doing what he ain't supposed to be doing. And it's just, you know, it, it's it's hard-pressed and it's upsetting because it's like, you know, we do our due diligence, and that was a private piece, man. And they're yeah. like, 
they're they're baiting on there. Like, you know, I've never in my life been part of any of that and I don't I don't never I've never shot a deer over a bait ever in my entire life and it like freaked me out dude like to the point that like I was losing sleep over it because I'm like there's there's corn on that private piece of property that I'm hunting and if anybody is to find it I'm the only one written permission you know what right. I'm saying like yeah, that's a yeah. that's a scary thing you know so it's it's a little frustrating and especially for you on publics the law rights man if you are on that's that's technically they could pin that on you, right? Them religiously, like yeah. or they want to come. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> if you get caught in there, you have to now do. You have to try and prove that it's not yours. You know what mm. I'm saying? Like, but what does everybody say? That's not my bait pile. That's like the drug guy that gets caught with meth in his pocket. Those aren't my pants. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I'm not too worried about it, be, obviously, because I have a clean conscience and I know it's not my of mine, course. right? Of course. So there's a camera there. I'm willing to bet whosoever pile it is, there's a picture of them dumping it. There's a picture of them on that camera one or one way, shape or form. That camera's tracked back to somebody and it ain't me. So I'm not too, too worried about it. I did reach out to one of my buddies that's game warden too, just to, um, you know, I didn't tell them where it was or anything like that, but like just sent them the video of like, this is what I just found, you know, not it, you know, um, I'm not too worried. It just pissed me off, dude, because, this is a new piece of public to me. I've spent a lot of time in there. Like, you know, this goes all the way back to like mm-hmm. Turkey. And, you know, spent some time in there during Turkey season. Went back <clears throat> when I got when I got back from Williams Woods and Water for my bear hunt in June. Mm-hmm. I went in there. I put in some mock scrapes. I put in cameras. I've been in and out of there like a handful of times throughout the summer. You know, really, really excited about this this piece, not only this year, but in the future too. And it's not easy. Like it's it's right. A process and i'm i'm working my ass off in there to find somebody just go in there and just half-ass throw something on the ground and put a camera two feet off the ground like just pisses me like i could do that you know what i mean like, it, it's, it's like jesus christ you know like it's not hard no and it's it, not just, it, it just it just irritates me that there's somebody in the woods hunting the same deer as me that's that low of a you know mm-hmm. just this has no ethics at all so yeah, I, I video to my dad it was later that night he didn't know i was already home and i sent it to him and he goes well you better you know you better watch out walking out of there you know that that guy got a picture of you you know he might he might come in there and try to confront you and i'm like who's confronting who <laughs> like i don't think he wants to confront me he's the one doing something illegal he's I'd like, illegally on not you right him, you know so but um I'm not too, too worried about it, but you know, I, it was a stupid setup anyway. So whoever it is, not only are you a scumbag for baiting, but you're an idiot because you don't even do that well. So you probably <laughs> use a crossbow and all that other stuff yeah, too. Yeah, Well, it is what but, it is. Speaking but, uh, of success, if you're listening to this, <laughs> and this sounds like it could be you. Holla at your boy. Like, let's have a talk. What it, up? It probably is you. If it, if you what think up? it's you, it probably yeah. is. You. Hey, if you got a, if you got a spy point, that's another thing. They're on a spy point. So what does that tell you about? You know what that means? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Anyways, if you got a spy point two feet off the ground and you accidentally dump some a uh, little bit of something on the ground and it's moldy, hit, hit, hit me up on IG. Let's talk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of success, um, <laughs> do you, you got any killers corners for us, my I man? Do. Uh, Ken D with his first fall turkey. Oh yeah, that's right. Whoop, whoop. Um, he's the man. I love Ken me so much. Too. And then um, I don't have a name. And a lot of times I reach out ahead of time to get the name. But uh, Gene Gunthier. Um, oh, his, his son's first year. Yeah, I wish I knew his son's name so I could specifically shout him out. But um, Little Gunther. Sounded, <laughs> yeah, sounded like a good story because, let me pull it up real quick. It's just your typical classic, uh, you know, classic it's always the days that the best stuff happens, right? It sounds like they're like overslept a little late to the tree. Mm-hmm. You know, everything's going the way you don't imagine it. When and, you're uh, a kid. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, no, I think it was dad's fault. Oh, for, really? Over sleeping. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but still got it done nonetheless. And it's just, it's so cool to read these stories. Right. Because like, dude, I'm 38 years old. And I, last year I shared that hunt with my dad mm-hmm. And I was sick as a dog and I overslept that morning and we were late to the tree rushing in there and, and got it done. And, you know, like in the moment, 
when everything's going wrong and you're like, I'm late, this, I forgot this, or, you know, it's like, this is terrible. But then when you have success, like, like Gene and the son did, it, it kind of makes the story. Like it's part of the story, you know? Mm -hmm. So you'll never forget. There was a cool meme that uh, was going around the other day and it was, and you could, we could all probably, I think this is very relevant for all of us. And you can probably attest to this is like walking in the woods. And it said, uh, it said it went from mm. pick up your feet and stop crunching to call me when you tag one. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And and to us as, you know, young sportsmen, like our dad would always say, pick up your feet. You're too loud in the woods. You know what I'm saying? And well, now, now, we've, I, now I tell my dad to pick yeah, up his exactly. feet. Pick up feet. You're too loud. Yeah. It's funny. It's, you know, uh, opening day. Or no, it was the week after opening day. It was me and my dad and my brother, and we go up to the family place where my dad hunts. And I like hunting there; it's enjoyable. We call it the pet and zoo. Um, my brother actually missed the deer up there the other day. Nice little buck, I guess. Um, but anyways, um, he, uh, we were we were walking in, and I'm leading the way. And my dad's like going off trail, and I'm like, "Yo, where are you going?" I'm like, the trail's over here, and I, and normally it's reversed opposite where he's like, hey, mm -hmm. hey, pay attention. We're over here, you know, but, like, it was kind of cool. It was kind of like, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but it was just it was, it was was just a cool moment, you know. You're like, oh, yeah. dad, dad, you're off trail. Over here, over here. This is how you get yeah. down, you know, and he'd been in there a million times, and he would say the same thing to us, you know, as growing up. So it was just uh, it's one of those things, you know. Sometimes, sometimes, though, me and Seth were talking about this. I, I don't care who you're with so you're way more focused solo right mm -hmm. if you if you pull up to a spot and you're by yourself you're like dialed in there's nothing to distract you you get your gear you walk in nice and quiet yada 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 uh, you can take the two best hunters you know and pull up to a spot together and like i don't care who you are like someone's gonna accidentally close the door a little harder than they should have like you just space out mm -hmm. right or like you're a little louder walking oh, yeah. in, or you say you know, hey, once we leave the truck, you know, we're not going to talk anymore. And then you get 100 yards down the road and you're like, hey, I meant to tell you, you know. And it's like, you, you just, it, it is what it is, right? You just got to take it for what it's worth because you're, at the end of the day, you're you're with your buddies. You're like, you can't be so strict and mm -hmm. so up. Like, you, you still got to, you got to have a little bit of looseness to the atmosphere. You, you, you know? got to put that to the wayside, honestly, because, you know, and at, you know, two years ago, three years ago, I, you know, I would get upset about it or be mad mm. about it. And it's like, for what dude? Like why, yeah. why are you getting all torn up? What? We don't shoot a deer today. Big, big yeah. whoop de doo man. We're going to shoot one tomorrow. Like who cares? Like just go and enjoy it. And it, it, it does. It takes, you know, when, when you hunt with somebody else or you're filming with somebody else or something at first, I'd get upset. Like, Oh, why is the guy with me making so much damn noise in the tree or what? It's like, who gives he's a shit? He's hunting too. This is his hunting trip too. He, you know, he's thinking the same thing about you. Damn, trust making all, all that kind of noise. I'm not making that. Noise. That's him. Yeah, but it's you have to enjoy it and you have to put it back yeah. aside. And I mean, look at everybody who has a kid and you know, like looking at Kurt, Kurt Geyer now. I mean, he's got the little ones in the blind. Could you imagine, Kurt? of all people having kids in a blind with him, just like Seth having a kids in the blind with him. Like these guys are hardcore hunters that like now they have kids in the blind. Like that's, you know what I'm saying? And they're just enjoying it and you got to take yeah. it all in and, and uh, just enjoy it. But well, I, I hunted with Seth and Emma last, uh, last summer we were, we were, uh, they were in the buddy stand and I was in the saddle above them. And Emma was just sitting there minding her own business. It's like she's she's a savage, dude. Like she knows she knows what to do. And uh, I got bored, so I started like taking little pieces of bark off the tree, and I was I was throwing it at Emma. Yeah. I was I was yeah. gonna ask, was Seth the loud one? <laughs> No, Emma did get, I don't know why, but she did get in a little uh, laughing fit, and we couldn't figure out what she was laughing so hard at, at. But at one point, I was throwing little pieces of bark at her, you know, landing on her lap, and mm -hmm. she turned around giving me the evil eye, like, what are you doing? Like, you're, why, why are you messing around? You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a little fun. There's no deer. We got to. Big country's going to get mad. <laughs> Uh, any other killers corners that's all i got that i can think of. i'm gonna tell you what man I, I you know i'm not one to kind of talk about this much and there's you know in success but i, I the roy bro seek one the yeah. deer that that team has been dropping off is absolutely incredible that last one that he just shot like dude insane 
Like, saw, where did this I even come I, from? Ohio and its state. Was it Ohio? It was Ohio. I don't know the backstory. I saw the pictures, but I don't. Well, that's what they're saying. It's saying it's Ohio, but oh, and yeah, then it was on Ohio Monster Bucks, so that kind of painted the picture. But yeah. there, dude, the amount of big deer that have been shot thus far this year is they're saying that it's it's the best year that they've ever seen. Um, Who? Uh, Ohio, Ohio oh. big bucks. Yeah. Um, th- they're saying that they have more dropped bucks in the past two weeks that are like one seventy plus, like just absolute just slammer slammer deer. Um, I don't know if they have a cold front. I don't. I haven't really been paying attention, yeah, but like, next. like what's different? Yeah, I don't know, but I mean, and, and it seems to be across the whole board. You know, like there's a lot of ton of really big deer. I mean, the guys, I mean, a lot of really good success. I mean, we've had a pretty cold season, a lot of like influx in temperatures and barometric pr- pressures, and I think a lot of food. I think it's going to be a hard winter. You know what I'm saying? Like that's just kind of my feeling. Um, with it but we'll see what ends up happening um let's snap into uh into the sponsors uh let's thank them for making the out you guys drive on a shot of bow tech yet you might want to go do so want to shoot a new bow it's probably time to go do it no make sure to promise when we started shooting bow tech uh, a lot of talk about them but glad that we put them in our hands shoot everything but um make sure to check out the bow tech what'd you say steve I mean, if anyone really serious about switching to Bowtech, I do happen to know where you can get a gray carbon <laughs> brand new still in the box. Box has never been open. Carbon one, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, one. Yep. Yeah, carbon one. Because I shoot the carbon one X. You yeah, have yeah. what the SS is what you're shooting? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I got a, I got, a, I got a carbon I sitting got a car- here. Carbon for carbon. sale potentially. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> you know, you know what we should do, Stevie. <laughs> Let's do let's do a giveaway, Steve. <laughs> yeah, sure. Fifty dollars a raffle ticket. Yeah. <laughs> All proceeds go to the madman. Oh, all right, thanks. And we should go to the outdoor drive, but that's all right. We'll leave that alone. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, we'll we'll use it for a tag. Um, Huntworth. We are brought to you by Huntworth. Get more for less with Huntworth. If you guys didn't check out the new Verdict, make sure to go and check that stuff out. Heat Boost. Uh, I just actually whipped out. Stevie's wearing his. I see that he's got his on. I was wearing my Heat Boost uh, vest uh, today, actually, in the brown. Uh, Stand-up product. I was warm as all could be getting ready this morning, walking around up and down the stairs. Uh, about to get heat boosted, Stevie. It's, it's it's that time of year we get heat boosted. Yeah, I'm thinking this weekend is probably going to be uh, – I was just talking to somebody about this today. They, they hit me up and you know, we got to talking. He was asking me about – But, but it, WCB does time. to have one. Okay. What I do is you have like – and then your late season heat boost. Base layers, right? So like it's almost like six levels in my opinion because you can go – Lightweight early season. Then, as it gets a little chillier out, you just add your base layers to your lightweight clothes. Yeah. Then it gets a little colder. You go to your Elkins. Right. And then it gets a little colder. You add your base to your Elkins. Mm-hmm. Then it gets a little colder. You go to the heat boost, and then yep. it gets a lot colder. You go heat boost layers. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, the hardest part is you got to be careful. Dial it in. Yeah. You can overdo it. For oh, you yeah. guys, for you guys looking for a promo code, you can use WCB fifteen. Uh, and save yourself 15%. There's always big sales going on. We don't actually have a promo code with them uh, just because there always is sales. Um, so I just ship you down to uh, when there's not a sale to use WCB15 on that one um, so you can save some. And it hooks up our boys at WCB. So you can use that promo code over there. Um, Nor'easter Game Calls, nor'eastergamecalls.com. If you guys haven't checked out um, the Grunt Tube, always good to have one in the pack. You can go from a dope bleat to a big buck grunt always good to have one in the pack this time of year you can get a fully custom one i don't know mercenary should be right around the corner here guys uh there should be some getting up on the website i'll have to get a check in on that we'll post something up on our on our story we haven't really posted much on those so we'll make sure to post a little bit of that over there fourth arrow camera arms fourth arrow camera arms.com if you guys are self filmers the new uh hyper light is out over there uh the saddle light so make sure and check that out if you guys are getting into filming. If you're a little bit more and you need something a little bit better and heavier, uh, they have other camera arms for that. And uh, tripods, if you are in the blind, they also have um, things for the blind. So make sure to check those guys out, 4th arrowcamerarms.com. And then Latitude Outdoors. Guys, I'm going to leave this one least. Uh, we're going to leave it for the last because... Uh, hey, everyone. This is Captain Steve Roger from Into the Blue TV. And as soon as I feel a little break from this heat, I know that hunting season is upon us. 
Actually, the first time I ever went hunting, a buddy took me. It wasn't my father or my grandfather. In fact, I took my father on his very first hunt. Well, Academy Sports and Outdoor Stores has everything to gear up for the field for less. Plus, you can shop a wide selection of ammo, shotguns, deer corn, rifle, feeder, game cameras, camo, and more from the brands you trust. Text HUNT24 to 22369 to take $20 off a $100 purchase when you shop hunting supplies at academy.com. Need a hunting license? Pick it up in store while you're shopping. This episode is brought to you by United Airlines. When you want to make the most of your vacation, book with United. They're an airline that cares about your travels as much as you do. United is transforming the flying experience with Bluetooth connectivity, screens, power at every seat, and bigger overhead bins to help fit everyone's bag. And with their app, you can skip the bag check line, get live updates, and more. Change the way you fly. Book your next trip today at united.com. Whether you're just looking to stay warm during a hunt or need maximum concealment, the clothing you wear can make or break a hunt. At MidwayUSA.com, we understand hunting clothing has come a long way with more meticulously crafted camo patterns, advanced scent control technologies, and weatherproof options to withstand the elements. Hunters have to wait until their favorite season, but shouldn't wait on gear, which is why MidwayUSA offers super fast shipping. When you're ready for your next system, log on to MidwayUSA.com. Latitude Outdoors is just knocking it out of the park, man. It's, I don't have enough words for these guys. The Carbon SS sticks, um, knock it right out of the park if you guys are looking for one of the most you know lightest usable best stick on the market there's no metal that's the biggest thing to me you can't you if you accidentally tup, touch them together as you're setting up you don't get that loud ting it sounds like, like bucks it, rattling you, I, you know i was talking to somebody about that the other day we should try to rattle in a buck with two latitude sticks just for National Geographics. I'm willing to do it. I'll do it from the ground, and I'll take two okay. sticks and rattle them together. And we'll film, film it. And if we can rattle on a buck with two latitude sticks, that would be epic. That would be epic. Um, the there is some the backpacks, the Ranger Twenty Two. Uh, there is some in stock at this point. Um, you know, there's a ton of saddles. The Lone Star, probably one of the most comfortable saddles mm. on the market, hands down. You the Maverick. <clears throat> don't 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 underestimate the Maverick, though. I've uh. uh I've hunted solely out of the Maverick so far this season, but last weekend I I was dying to do a sit in the Lone Star. Yeah, and uh, I sat in it Saturday night, and oh my god, it is! And I love the Maverick, absolutely yeah. the Maverick. Mm-hmm. But uh, basically, what I wanted to do is I wanted to give the Lone Star like a quick run through just to make sure you know my bridge loops are in the right spot and everything's set. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna put the Lone Star back away probably till like I start doing like all day or longer sits in the rut and stuff like that. But uh, <laughs> dude, it, it, the Lone Star is unreal. It is. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you another thing that's uh, pretty sweet is I finally swapped out my grip tape to the Glowies. Yeah, I know. Uh- so I put my own grip tape on when I first got my sticks because Latitude didn't even have their own grip tapes available at the time. That's what I have on mine. <clears throat> yeah, I made them for you, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, you yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. they were great. But uh, fantastic. But I was, it was, I was, uh, I was thinking about the having the glow steps and how, you know, how sweet that would be. So finally, I swapped them out and put them on. Dude, they are pretty sweet when you come down in the dark. It's, yeah, uh, I'm. I'm looking forward to. I'm gonna order some and get some myself. Um, and I'm I'm looking forward to using them honestly. So, make sure to use the promo code Outdoor Drive on that one. Save yourself some. It's actually a pretty big savings c- comparable um, to most. So use the promo code Outdoor Drive on that one. Save yourself some. And uh, we want to wish you guys good luck this week. And we'll see you guys back. We're gonna tune on into the boys from uh, Woods in the Water here. And thanks for taking the ride. Outdoor 
Drive Podcast. All right, guys, we are back on for a good old moose catch-up. This is a little Sunday night special. We got the boys from uh, Williams. I always do that wrong. Woods and Water, right? Or is it Water and Woods? Woods and Water Outfitters. Woods and Water yeah. Outfitters. That's what it is. How are we doing, guys? Great. Thanks for having us. Hey, as, as always. We had a good time last time, so we figured we'd, we'd do it again. And then since it was a, a moose slaughter fest... Uh, we can't <laughs> wait to hear the stories. I mean, we we dream of those days, right? We don't get to we don't get to do much moose hunting. So, let's kick it right off. Why don't you guys tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about what you do for those that missed out on the last episode? Yeah, well, I'll start. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm the owner of Williams Woods and Water Outfitters. We're uh, we're located in Zone 12, Central New Brunswick, Canada. Um, specializing in, in black bear and, and moose hunts, do a little fishing on the side too, multi-species fishing, striped bass, salmon, things like that. Uh, we got Tyler here on, that's, uh, one of our guides. He's been, he's been with me from the, from the start and one of my best friends from growing up. So Tyler, how did you get into it with, uh, with Brian? Just. Brian and I met probably 15 years ago, and uh, both had a had a real good passion for hunting. And he said he was starting an uh, open business, and asked me if I guys said, "Yeah, I get into it." So it's been uh, no looking back. It's been a great decision. We met a lot of good folks. Had a lot of good times in the last six or seven years. That's awesome. Is it a little bit tougher for you to get a guide license without owning a guide a guide service, or is it a little bit different procedure? No, for, for us, for guys, I think it's a 50-question multiple-choice test. Um, basically, if you spend any time in the woods hunting and fishing, you're, you know, you're going to pass the test. And I believe there's a study guide for it now. That's awesome. That's absolutely awesome. Well, why don't you guys take us right back to the beginning where where it all started as far as moose season because it kicked off with you know spring bear and then it went into moose hunting season. So what are you doing to prep for a moose season to be successful before the clients hit camp? Yeah, we usually, you know, we go through our bear season May and June to, you know, the middle of June. We're usually wrapping up and take a little bit of a breather there for a week or two and and then get back out in the woods and and kind of switch gears and go into to moose mode and just um you know really prepping our mineral and, and and salt lick sites and putting cameras on them just trying to trying to keep an eye on things and watch some antlers grow over the summer and and um and then we roll into roll into august and september things start changing and you know you start entering into uh into the rut phase or pre-rut phase in early september when they're shedding velvet and uh and our moose season is uh runs the last full week of of september ending on a saturday without rolling into october so the dates kind of fluctuate a little bit year to year and uh, it's only five days long it used to be three so it's a it's it's a high pressure a high pressure hunt and it takes a lot of prep work to get ready for it and you got you got five days to get it done and you got all those variables uh of you know the fluctuating dates which affects the rut you got you got weather being a factor and, and, you know, you now like we're last several years, there's been some, you know, rolling into hurricane seed and stuff like that. So we're keeping an eye on those types of things. And, and uh, yeah, so it's just, as far as prep work goes, it's just trying to keep a, uh, keep tabs on them. Um, but I will say, you know, over the 27 moose hunts and, and moose kills that I've been a part of um, only one bull has been one that I've had on camera in the summer wow. and it's, it just, it just changes. It changes, um, August, late August into September, you know, it's really fun to get pictures of them though. And it uh, gets you excited leading into September, but we know it all, it all changes and you just kind of have to go once you get hunting and you just go with, with what's going on in the woods. So you were talking about salt licks and minerals and stuff like that, like that, that's a, uh, you can, you can, use that in the off season or can you also hunt them during the regular season also because i know some providences they allow it right yeah i mean there's there's no there's no laws against it but i will say that you know the bulls and stuff they get off the salt in august uh the cows might visit every once in a while like leading into the fall and stuff like that but they're pretty much done with it once once you get into september and and so it's re really what it is it's just it's just 
something to keep a camera on and, and keep tabs and kind of get an inventory of what's in the area and, and get you excited. You know, surprisingly enough, though, we did uh, one of our bulls um, in our season this year was right around one of our salt sites, but we uh, we haven't had a picture of him. He was just he was there. He was within within 50, 60 yards of it when we when we took the shot, but we never had a trail camera picture of him all year. That's nuts. When yeah. do they typically shed out? Like first week of September ish. Yeah, this year, you know, it was a little early. You know, we we seen some some breaks and and some hooking start in late August and into first of September, and and a lot of velvet was off that that first second week of September. Yeah. And is it, typically, is that about when the salt licks kind of start shutting down too, when the velvet comes off, or before? yeah, just yeah, just right around that time, just right, right before yeah. that, yeah. And uh, there, there's still some moose though that uh, you know that were shot in moose season that you know had a little bit of velvet hanging or, and there's been moose shot even like the small bulls like the spikes and stuff like that um, you know that are still in full velvet. That's wild. That's wild. Mm. And still a lot of velvet to go off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, you see them sometimes like they'll have like like Brian was saying you see guys will shoot them and they'll just have like pieces on some of the tines and stuff that they'll have them. I mean, we even find them during shed season that still have it on it like they can't get it all off or it's kind of like, you know, just kind of hardened on to it. I mean, we had one set had like this big curly thing about two feet off the back of it that was from velvet and just never got it off the horns, which is pretty crazy, yeah. honestly. Yeah. So my question is like, what what type of areas are you looking for when you know you're looking for this moose rut activity? Because obviously you're calling at them, right? But they're going to be staging up in certain areas. So like, where are they they trying to be at? Well, this year um, we had a really dry year, so you know, trying to get around water holes and stuff like that was a little bit easier versus other years when you have lots of lots of rain and stuff waters everywhere you know you got to you got to pay a little bit more attention to what's going on and where they're at uh this year you could focus in a little bit more on like the prominent water holes in the ponds and the lakes um but uh you know find the cows really in in september and what is the what are the cows doing they're just feeding and uh, you know the hardwood hardwood feed and higher elevation myself personally i like higher elevation in, in that time of year um with lots of hardwood feed and some cover down below and and uh water hole really close by within you know half a kilometer a kilometer away tyler and, where uh, where do you like to focus to try and find <laughs> moose well um uh, i've been i've been pretty successful uh hunting litter cuts but uh, a little bit of a different <laughs> say it for me one time tyler <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a different uh it's a little bit of a different technique um you know broad focusing in on where the moose are I'm, I'm focusing in on trying to find um multiple moose maybe in the morning and exactly what steve said no moose next cut so you know depending on where you're at um and the season and what the cows are doing it i mean it's, it's not as much fun of a hunt but um it, it all depends on who you've got and what they want to do um but we've been very successful um and the clear cuts and all of them as well. I did do that this year, which was kind of strange, and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we really, we really forced him out of his comfort zone this year and made him, made him spend at least one day hunting the thick stuff and calling, and he, he, he got it done. So, 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 so yeah. when I think of moose hunting, I think of like kind of you know like they do in the in the north woods of Maine here. They just drive around on the roads and they'll like they'll call one area but then you have like those guys that are like real hardcore and they'll get like back a mile or two they kind of know where those moose kind of hang out and spend a lot of their time like is that is it really like dependent on with clients like yeah that i mean that, that plays a factor for sure if you got the you know the people that are more mobile and and um you know hardcore hunters that want to do that that backcountry stuff we do that and and, you know, a lot of our, like New Brunswick, a lot of our ground or, you know, territory is, is road accessible to some degree, right? And so, yeah, like I get it, I get out of the truck and I walk, we put on, we put on miles a day walking, but, you know, if something doesn't pan out, I do want to be able to get back and, and get in the truck and go to another spot and, and try something else. So, 
And the other thing too, is I like to call moose out to the road to give the hunter a good opportunity and, and a good shooting lane. Um, so we, we find, you know, old, you know, abandoned logging roads or things like that, that are, are grown in and altered in and, and uh, have some feed along the ditches and stuff like that, that, you know, would attract a moose and, and try and call them out into that. And then, and then you're trying to shoot them as close as you possibly can to the road, right? Because then the work kind of begins and it can kind of be a nightmare. Yeah. You know, I always say, uh, shoot till the moose is down because every step he takes into the woods is more work for us. <laughs> oh, that's, I, I mean, like what, what is like a really bad, like, can you, are you allowed to, um, like, are you allowed to, to quarter them out and bring them out or do they have to be whole? No, you, you can, you can quarter them out as, and you have to just bring everything with you to the, the DNR station to register it. Like, so, oh, so you can't leave anything. No. So you, okay. So that they can then identify what it is and, and, ah, so do they age them too for you and everything? Like as far as like when they, when you check them in? Yeah, they do. They take, um, they do a couple things. They take a nose measurement and their stats on, you know, what you get from the meat yield out of the nose measurement. And then, uh, they pull a tooth, um, for aging. Wow. That's wild. Yep. What's uh what's a typical age of a mature or older moose, bull moose? Yeah, I mean we like to we like to aim for those, you know, four and a half, five and a half plus. Okay, so similar uh, to deer. Yeah. And uh, you know, you get them you get them up to ten, right? Like and they can even they can even be older than that, but they start going the other way. When when is that? When is that? Like when they start to turn around and go on the decline? Uh, I'm going to just like throw a number out there and probably say around that seven and a half, eight and a half year old bulls will start going the other way. That's, that's nuts. I, I, <laughs> you see them like, like guys will, I, you see it more moose than you do whitetails where guys like are like really persistent on year after year after year and like grow, you know, like watching them. Yep. But then you said that you have your trail cameras out there, but you the ones well, that you're shooting aren't the ones that are on camera. Well, that actually brings up a question. So you not often have you shot the same bull that you have on camera, but have you ever had a bull the following year on camera that you recognize from the year before? Yeah, I've had a few of those. Um, and, you know, this year I found, you know, definite – sheds of a, a bull that i had on camera in that same spot last summer i found his sheds in the same area this spring and i had him on camera this summer um definitely the same bull same mm. characteristics but then he disappeared in 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 moose season so it's just telling me that that's uh that's more of a spring summer area for him and then he he goes and packs his bags and goes on tour but now range wise compared to like a white tail because white tail do the same thing usually do you think moose cover more ground than than a typical mature whitetail it all depends on what he's got for food cover and cows and what keeps them happy yeah man i don't even i wouldn't even know what the number is on on where they go but i just you know you hear stories of them traveling like 10 miles and T tyler's and, got and, stats down there i saw his eyes yeah. light up no. <laughs> what do you yeah. think tyler <laughs> I think generally moose moose have less of a distance than whitetails, um, but we have found the last few years a couple of bulls that uh, call them nomads that, that you know you don't pick them up on any cameras and they walk through in hunting season. So I think there's a few of them that spend the time roaming around the big boys, um, but I, I think a lot of them have a pretty tight home range uh, for the most part. Interesting. I guess it's the same as whitetails, though. You get those home bodies that just stick. That that's just their home core area is super super tight, and then you got those ones you got them all summer long, and he he just he just disappears, and you don't see him again till till next summer. You know. I think with the and I I think with the the biggest thing is you know with our season fluctuating a couple of days on the front or back end in that time of year, you get you get different activity when you when you first start the season and, and you kind of assess the situation when you get into it on the like it goes from Tuesday to Saturday and uh, you assess the situation when you get into it because 
you know, what's going on the week before or two weeks before moose season is completely different than what's going on during. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this year, you know, everything leading into moose season was a little off because two weeks before the season, we had a really big cold snap where it went down to basically zero for a few days and the, and the trail camera activity picked up like crazy, had bulls raid on cows. And, and then the week in between that and moose season, it went up to 30, 30 to 35 degrees during the day Celsius, you know, so it got super hot and it seemed to just like quiet the woods down completely and the weekend before moose season when we were doing our scouting you know we weren't finding any fresh breaks or or hookings from bulls from like the previous week you could tell that it was when that cold snap happened and so then it's just like all right well let's just get in the woods and once uh, tuesday morning opens up we're just going to figure out what's going on and uh really pretty evident that you know they were on a little bit of a lockdown the, the big bulls were were paired up with with their cows and not a whole lot of response going on. Um, got a lot of myself personally, we hunted Tuesday through Friday for our two bulls. We got one Wednesday and got the other one Friday night. And in, in between that, we were calling in some smaller bulls that we were passing and, you know, they were, they were very responsive coming to the cow call. Um, but once you started acting like a bull, they got pretty skittish and took off. So it was kind of telling us that, you know, Okay, the big bulls are around they're and they're beating these little guys up and pushing them out, but they'll, they'll still come to try and see if there's a, a cow by herself kicking around kind of thing. And then we just, when I see that going on, I just know that you have to cover a lot of ground and, you know, spend 15 to 20 minutes in an area and call. And if you don't get a response from a, a, a bull that you want, then you move. And um, because you want to find that bull that's either already bred a cow and, and moving and looking for some more or just a lone bull that's kind of, you know, in that middle class that is trying to show himself or show his dominance. Right. And uh, that's what we did. We just kept moving and, and covering ground and, and eventually got some really good call calling action with those two bulls that we got, you know, that put on a really good display for us. And, and uh, that's what the boys wanted to do. No bull next cut. I was yeah. just going to say. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Well, why don't, uh, so, uh, Tyler, you, your guy got, uh, his bull open today, no? He did. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit of an interesting story. So we, uh, had a spot picked out, um, thought we were going to be there first. Uh, we got there pretty early, waited, heard some moose, thought it was going to be over at daylight, walked a mile realized the moose that we heard was uh electronic collar and their people that beat us in the road which uh anyways it was it was uh kind of you know we'd walked a mile and wasted half an hour so we we pretty much ran back out the road if you can imagine that but we we got out as quickly as we could and i went to uh my second spot and there was a bit of a forestry operation going on there so that was a bust so then we decided that we were going to go and get away from people which we did um, we did see some moose in the clear cut that were in a really bad spot and not what he was looking for. So we passed on them, um, and, and drove into this road that, that, uh, Brian had pointed out. I was in there on, uh, the Saturday before there was, there was really no sign in there, but it was close. I said, we'll go check it. It's a 20 minute walk. And we just walked in the road and found a wallow. Um, so we just started calling and, uh, had a cow and a, and a calf and a 12 point came out on the road. And uh, the, the 12 point was acting uh, very strange for being with a cow. You know, he was a, he was an average sized bull. Uh, he wasn't a small guy. He, you know, he had, he had pans, um, but he wanted nothing to do with us. When I started raking, he ran up the road and uh, in the woods. So we kind of, we kind of thought that was the end of it. I saw oh, that's his wallow. That's his cow. So we're, we're just kind of deciding what to do. And, uh, I heard another snap in the woods and we, and I raked and I thought it was this 12 point. So I said, you know, we're going to put a show on if nothing else and uh, called for maybe 20 seconds and then raked and uh, he came right out and stood in the ditch about 15 yards from us. And that was the, the end of it. So. That's crazy. So, wow. so, so take, take us through it real quick. Cause that whole, like you say you're calling and then raking and what is that like? take us through like the sequences why why and how they work so yeah so when when i saw that small bull um kind of acted a bit aggressive with them just 
more or less wanting to put a show on for for the client with me it's it's you know it's interesting to see usually the bulls that size will, will put a good show on for you and you'll get them you know you can get them 10 feet away from you if you want before they'll take off so that's kind of what we were trying to do just to get a little bit of an experience for them um so when he took off like Brian was saying earlier, I kind of clued in that that probably wasn't his area. There's a bigger bull there. So we, we just kind of waited for a few minutes to see what went on. And I just heard a branch break in the woods, which, you know, was was kind of in the same area they went, but not it, it was the general area, but it wasn't. I was pretty certain it wasn't them. So as soon as I heard that, I just I raked the tree. So basically you take a, a moose shoulder blade, a scapula and, you know, found a good hardwood tree just tried to mimic a bull that's that's mark um grunted back at me and started raking so usually you've got some time like i had planned on video and this for the guy all this stuff but but this all went down from the time he answered me and started coming i raked again uh and and let a grunt out and by the time i was done he was standing you know 15 yards from us and and you know, it's like you see in the, a lot of the videos, you know, he's coming, shaking his horns at us with, you know, the whites of his eyes. And uh, it's a really, really cool experience to, to, to get to see that. Um, it's a bit close for my liking. I liked him 40 <laughs> yards or better. 15 yards is a bit tight. But, um, yeah, he uh, made a couple of good shots. Moose, Moose ran, I don't know, 10 yards in the woods and, and fell down a really good spot. So it was a really good morning. Does the, Do they ever get too aggressive when they're that close? They can, yep. I've I've been eight to ten feet from them before, um, and I know Brian has too. But so, the bigger bulls usually will come out of it quicker. It's the smaller bulls you got to watch. It's the ones that's got stuff to prove. The bigger the bigger guys kind of snap out of it pretty quick if you you know if you yell at them or or clap your hands or, or something like that. The smaller ones sometimes you know I've been in a couple spots where you're starting to look for trees to get behind so they're not coming at you. So what happens in that scenario though like like have you had one charge you at some point or per personally nothing the closest i've ever been probably is 10 12 feet um and, and we ended up shooting that bull and it was a complete i realized i realized at the time when we were hunting that it, it was the wrong setup after after it all went down it, it worked and drew the bull out and the guys got the broadside shot but it was a complete wrong setup because I was, you know, basically 10 feet away from the moose when they shot it. So, um, you know, I would never put myself in that position again with a moose that aggressive without having somebody with a gun or, or that. Cause he was literally like two lunges. He was across the road at me. So Brian, have you ever had it where it was a little bit too close, too scary? Yeah, but like not not to the point where like the moose puts his head down and, and comes at me or anything like that. Like I've I kind of know know my limits where I'm gonna call it and say that's enough kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So you know I've been in definitely quite a few situations where the bull has been. You know I could I probably reach out and slap it if I wanted to, but it's it's it just back up and, and get out of the way. There's no need no need to get any closer. And, um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've seen them in that, in that trance where they're in full display of, of trying to show themselves. Right. And, and even this year and during moose season, we had a pretty good, pretty good video footage of, uh, a small, I think it was an eight or 10 point, uh, coming up the road at us. And I know if I stayed where I was, like, he probably would have walked right into me. Um, but you know, we got him to come within 10 feet of our clients and, and then I shoot him off and, and, you know, the rest is history, let him go. But, um, Last year had a really nice bull within 10 yards um, for about six and a half minutes and me ducked under a tree in the fetal position, just hoping that uh, it didn't go any worse. <laughs> but, but, but it was, uh, it was more waiting for the hunter to shoot. That didn't happen. Um, so yeah, we've been, we've been close. It's a lot of fun. It's a pretty good rush. So when they, when you're calling at them and they come out, right. And like, you see, like like you know like the little video that i saw even with you brian and you see them all the time these guys are wearing orange standing there like and they don't they don't really care like what what is like are they just in that moment they're just so so wired yeah they're just you know nice thing about orange in the fall you're kind of matching the the orange <laughs> leaves behind you kind of thing i guess but yeah i know it's it's more scent and noise and and what's going on and 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 the type of movement that you're doing that's gonna 
really bust you or not. Scent is the biggest thing. Um, you know, a, a bigger bull will be quicker to scent you and bust you before a, a smaller one or a, that middle class one that I was talking about. Right. And they always, the bigger ones always circling and come into the wind. Oh, so you have to try and shoot them before they come downwind of you once they start yeah. to get kind of close. So you have to kind of, yeah. I, and yeah. I, fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. The 1911 is one of the most iconic firearms in history. Designed by John Browning, the 1911 was the standard issue sidearm of the U.S. military from 1911 to 1985. While Colt produced the original, almost every major firearm company has produced its own version. It's wildly revered for its reliability, crisp trigger, and is still a favorite for all types of shooters. Whether you're looking to buy or build a 1911 and just about everything for guns, log on to MidwayUSA.com. Boat Trader, America's largest boating marketplace, offering easy financing and over 100,000 boat listings to choose from. Sell, find, and finance new or used boats on America's largest boating marketplace. Visit BoatTrader.com to get started. Get it. Well, take us through your haunts because you had, what, two? Yeah, I had two guys with me, yeah. Yeah, there's a... Uh... Again, the, fir the first day was kind of, I'll say, a little bit disappointing for me. I didn't have as much luck as, as Tyler there. You know, I went to where I thought it was going to be a for sure thing and really didn't have much of response at all for for calling. So, you know, just had to kind of switch gears and, and do a little, like, after our morning hunt. Um, we've seen some cows and small bulls or whatever, but it wasn't what I was expecting in my primary location. So uh midday just kind of had lunch and and said boys we got to go do a little bit of scouting and see what's going on in you know some different spots because i didn't like what i what i saw this morning and you know we did that and uh the first evening same thing i oh yeah we called the uh, i had three bulls the all small within that you know four to ten point range that all came into the call but it did not make a sound just all they just showed up we were just standing there and all of a sudden boom there's a moose and it was just those little ones that were coming in to investigate, right? So I was just, you know, I didn't like that either. You know, that many small bulls in an area like that. So um, day two, I went to a, another spot um, in the morning, never had an answer. And I didn't waste too much time there. Um, went to another location that I knew of and um, called there and, and immediately got a response. And that's what I, that's what I like. And uh, this bull was, was starting to come. So we set up on him and uh, he was down over a hill in, in a big boggy water hole area. And I knew it was going to take him some time to get to us because he's probably answered about, you know, 350, 400 yards away and it's pretty thick down in there. So he was grunting the whole way. And, and then when he started to rake back at me, it didn't sound like a big bull. And uh, so I was like, uh, well, we'll just keep working him and see if he'll come out. But just, you know, as that was going on, I heard a, another branch nap up the hill from us so this one was circling us and um you know coming into the wind and so we were kind of not set up properly for that one but this is when we end up shooting um he come across and come out of the plantation above us got onto our side of the trail and came down through the trees raking and grunting and uh got probably within 15 20 yards of of the hunters so that we had the moose and then the hunters and then me down below and there was just a big wall of softwood trees there that that moose had to clear and he would have been right on top of the guys with the, with the gun and uh he just kind of locked up and grunted and raked and i grunted and raked and then he decided that he didn't like what he what he saw or heard and got back out on the road and started walking down towards us and i could i could see up past the hunters and this was on a hill and i seen this thing coming down coming down the the road through the trees and uh i was signaling to them that it's a shooter and they couldn't see it so he come down a little ways and then turned and went back up and then he got into the woods and where he came from and i was like oh this deal this deal's over and all this kind of took place probably within a half an hour so i got back out on the trail and i said all right follow me we're gonna have to go up and try and reset up for this guy because he's still grunting a little bit but he's grunting away from us 
And uh, when I went up and I raked the raked the trees along the edge of the, the trail, he just lit right up again and got really fired up and started smashing everything. So I repositioned the hunters down down the hill a little bit, and I got on the directly across the trail from him. And we just had a call back and forth for another like 20 minutes. And he was raking and grunting. I was raking and grunting. And we were, I was just trying to get him fired up. And finally, he committed again and came straight out towards me. And when he did that, when he stepped out, he was completely broadside to the hunters down below him. And he had no idea they were there. And they they, they put three into him. And uh, so he went down, you know, 15, 20 yards in the woods. So that was that was day two. Nice bull. It was a 50-inch a fifty inch bull, uh, probably 900 and, 930, 940 pounds. Um, you know, I think they estimated 580 or 590 pounds of meat on the thing. Wow. So it was a... Yeah, it was a really nice one. And uh, then the rest of the, the next couple of days, it was kind of the same thing. We were calling. We were seeing moose every morning, every evening, small bulls, cows. And and then uh, Friday Friday evening is when we got into that second one where, again, it was like the that evening it was like the third or fourth spot that uh, we hunted since like 5 o'clock on. And uh, it was been like 6.30 at night when we got that one. And when we walked down this road, um that's what i was telling you about the salt lick site is that it was kind of cool because the sun was setting behind us and this road kind of went down into dead end into a into a plantation bog area and the sun was just beaming on this bull's antlers they were glowing glowing orange uh from the sun and uh, he was facing away from us at the time and uh the hunter saw it first because I was kind of on the right side. He was on the left and I couldn't see down the tree line, but he saw it. And when I stepped in, I'm like, okay, this is, this is game on here. And so I said, like, don't shoot yet. I'm going to call and turn him around and bring him to us. And he was like 180 yards probably when we seen him. And again, I just started grunting and raking and he, tur- he swung right around and came up the trail and just raking the trees the whole way up and grunting. And, and uh, we brought him to 50 yards and then he swung perfectly broadside for us right there on the on the trail i just kind of walked to the left and brought him across and he put four into him (laughs) yeah and uh so that was that was it and the streak continues that i don't have to hunt the last day of moose season i love it that's awesome so so you were saying you like and you see all those videos those guys just dump clips into them more or less because you just don't want them to be running far right you want to put as many as you can into them just 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 put the core locks right to them huh oh they'll eat them and uh you know there's so much meat on a moose like and everything's everything's good everything's usable so it's just uh and they can they can take bullets like like nothing right they're tanks and uh so you just my philosophy is don't stop shooting until he's down or you can't see him anymore right (coughs) oh Tyler, I know you're itching here, buddy. We've talked a lot of calibers and ballistics, buddy. So why don't you uh, spit it on us? What what what, what do you like for uh, calibers and ballistics and whatnot? I uh, I run a 300 Win Mag, um, 180 grain bullets. I've been back and forth. I've shot Corlocks. I've shot Hornady. I'm actually going to Newfoundland with with Brian in a few weeks. I've got uh, trying out some Burns Copper. Um, the TTSX, I'm, they shot really nice out of my rifle when I set it in. I'm, I'm curious to see what they do. Um, an all-around gun, if you're coming here moose hunting, 30 out 6, 30 out 6, 180 grain bullet, you want a core lock, you know, a core lock, if you're going to go with a lead bullet, a core lock or nozzle partition. Um, copper's definitely a bit better if you can get a hold of like a Horner DCX or a Federal Trophy Copper, or the Burns TTSX, just – a moose is a big animal. Like I've, I've shot them, had guys shoot them with a 300 wind mag at 150 yards, you know, slash ways through the vitals and you don't get an exit hole. They'll lodge and hide on the other side. So you want something that's going to stay together and carry through, um, you know, up close, all those moose that we, the three of them, that moose that we shot were all under 50 yards and, and, uh, you know, the bullets went completely through out of the guns. It, did an immense amount of damage even up that close. So um, shot placement's probably the bigger the bigger key than, than filling the air with lead. Um, you know, you want to make your good shot, your first shot, good one, take out, you know, double lung him or, or take a shoulder blade out so he's not going far. And then after that, you're just trying to, you're basically trying to get him to, to, to fall on the road or, or right where he's at. I'm, I'm not sure what 
what our round it was, but I was just up at dad's house a couple of weeks ago and he had like three boxes for the 300 wind mag and it was something good too, federal something or other. And he's like, no good. I'm like, what do you mean? No good. He's like, talk to Tyler. He said, no good. <laughs> <laughs> so now he's going to the range, the three range rounds now before his moves on because Tyler, Tyler said they're no good. So can't they? <laughs> I, uh, I just started, you know, using copper bullets actually the last couple of years. And, and, uh, you know, we've had great luck with them. Um, great penetration on deer and moose with them. So, you know, um, they're, they don't expand as much as a lead bullet. So, so they'll travel through, like they don't, they don't flatten right out. Um, the, those barns, I think your dad got a hold of. I think that's they what shot that's really cool. nice. Yeah. They, they shot really nice out of my gun. Like it, it wasn't, uh, you know, usually in a lead sled, it's a half a box to, to get it to group and, you know, the size, of, you know, like an inch circle. And I only fired, I think, four out of the, out of the that time and, the, you know, one to get it down and then the next three were all touching. So they just seemed to group really well, high ballistic coefficient, and uh, they, they just shot well out of my gun. So he was looking for uh, advice on bullets for a moose. I'm sure there's plenty more questions coming when the, now in the next year. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. The Mardics are coming moose hunting next fall. <laughs> I can't wait. I might come a week early just to get <laughs> in, you know, see what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> in all reality, it would be awesome to to, to dump a moose with a forty five seventy or a, you know a four one of those big. You know, Brian and I have talked about it. Our next moose hunt, uh, if one of us gets our tags doing something like that, that'd be pretty cool. Like all those moose that we shot this year were under fifty yards. The only risk you run and you see a big one at three, 400 yards, you're, you're not in good standing with a 4570 or a 444 Mario. Well, you get a second gun, no? Yeah. So you could, someone could carry a 4570 and someone could still have the 300 wind mag if, if uh, she hits the fan, no? Right. Yeah, you could do that. So, so you were just talking about going to Newfoundland. So you guys are going to hunt for yourselves. What, what's that? that? Yeah. Team party. Yeah, no, we're, there's a group of us going over. I've, I've never been to Newfoundland, and I said if I was ever going to go, I was, was going to go and, and moose hunt and see the and see the province too. So that's what we're doing. There's a group of us heading over there um, with an outfitter friend that we know, and and uh, so yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. You know, we don't get our our licenses very often here. You know, a lot of people can go through and maybe get one two tags their whole lives in New Brunswick as a resident, right? Yeah. Is because it's that 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 lottery draw, and, and so with Newfoundland, they have such a high moose population that you can pretty much buy tags from. Outfitters get like big, way bigger allocations than we do here. Um, you know, some outfitters over there might have 30, 30 moose tags. When you know we are lucky to get one. So now, what's their uh, size and population compared to New Brunswick? Because they have so many tags, is, is the they still. Have big bulls like new brunswick or but i think you know population wise they they destroy us with the population of moose um you know the way back in the day i don't know exactly the day but they they brought they introduced moose in newfoundland from new brunswick i yeah. think they brought eight eight or ten over there whatever it was and then it just exploded and not a lot of not a lot of predators and and that sort of thing for them so they you know they just explode and as far as size goes i think you know, I think New Brunswick has them beat as far as size of moose um, or that you can get. But numbers wise, they got us there for sure. Now, the 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 moose that came from New, Newfoundland to uh, repopulate New Brunswick, was that all of New Brunswick or just a section? I remember hearing that story as a no, kid. They, they, they took moose from New Brunswick to Newfoundland. Oh, I thought it was the other way around. Okay. No, no, no. They took, they took I, moose I from moose. six or something. Yeah, from, from Miramichi area. Yeah, up, up uh, the Bathurst Highway is the story I got as a kid. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, I thought it was the other way around for some reason. But yeah, the story that and you guys can fact check me, tell me if it's correct or not. But the story that I had heard was they had tried a handful of times to repopulate and it didn't take, and then they finally took that one group that you're talking about, and that was the one that actually worked. Yeah, that could be. That could be. Yeah, I think I think there was a couple tries, and I don't know if it's the second or third time it worked. But yeah, they the the ones 
the, yeah, you're right, Steve. They're right from uh, the Bathurst area up in just north of Miramichi. Yeah. We used to call it Moose Alley when I was a kid. Yeah, so I'm, get, I'm getting tired of watching other people shoot big bulls. I'm going to kill something. <laughs> <laughs> How long has it been since you've drawn? Williams Brian. Water Team Building Trip. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I actually had my, I've had my tag twice so far in my life. I had it when I was 19 and then I had mine in 2020. Wow. Yeah. So you think you'd draw again in New Brunswick or no, it would be a tough. I hope, I hope so. But I'm, I'm, I'm like, my son's seven years old now. I'm hoping, you know, I'll wait a few years until he's old enough to come with me and yep. hopefully draw one in the next, you know, six, seven years or something like that. Let him shoot it. Right. Yeah. So so, what is it up there? It's it's virtually over the counter. Like, is it is it an expensive thing? The the, the Newfoundland. Um, you usually have to go through an outfitter or a guide over okay. there, right? So it's you know, I guess the prices might fluctuate a little bit. Hmm. And the and for New Brunswick, you just can non-residents put in for that one. Yeah, we have we have two ways to to get a tag in New Brunswick as a non-resident. You can you can get one through an outfitter. Um, so outfitters put in for a draw, and uh, and then they also draw about twenty five or thirty tags in a separate draw just for a non-resident a non-resident pool. Okay. Um, that runs February to the end of April. That draw opens up for those non-resident tags, and again, it's a it's a hard one to get. I think they probably have 10 to 12,000 non-residents that apply for the, like you gain credits year after year. It's just throw your, yeah. And now now, once you draw, if you get drawn for that, that's just like a, what is it like? Would you get the pay to put in? No, 25, 40 40 bucks. bucks. And then once you, if your name gets drawn, what it's like, what? $180 tag or something like that. Or am I wrong? No, the moose tag six eighty. Oh, six eighty. 680. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's still not that bad though, no. right? I mean, like for what but it I, is. If you draw that tag, you can't DIY it. You have to hire a guide. Correct. Yep. Yeah. That's super cool though, honestly. I mean, is does it go by so if you if you're in that draw, right, and you you draw, is it for the whole entire province of New Brunswick or do you have to pick like like zones or something like that? Yeah, when you when you purchase your license, you have to pick a zone that you're hunting in. Okay. The, the non-resident the non-resident uh, draw is nice that way because if you get drawn, then you can pick your zone. When a resident is putting in for the draw, you pick your zone when you apply. Okay, I see yeah. what you're saying. Okay, so mm-hmm. like if I if I was to draw, I could then contact you and say, "Hey, I want to come hunt with you." And then yeah. you tell me what what area that to put in for, or if I said, oh no, I'm gonna go, or if I want to go with Ryan or whatever, you just you have to go with that zone that. He, so, so you're not picking it and then g- picking your guide. You're picking your guide first and then and then putting in for that zone. So that's kind of cool because you can just cream of the crop. Like we, I'm, you know, like us. If we were to draw, we'd want to go with you. You know what I'm saying? Like we wouldn't get stuck with. Or pick a different outfitter. So that's kind of stuck cool. in those situations where the real put it all into that tough zone to draw or higher chance to draw, but you're going to get stuck with a with a bad zone. Yep. Yeah, and, that, and that's that's what happens, right? So if we, I don't know how many zones, Tyler. You probably have this number in your head that that people put in for moose is a twenty twenty five. I think it's twenty five. Yeah, I don't think you, I don't think there's moose and gram. I think it's twenty five. I think yeah. twenty six. 25 different zones that people put in for with a different number of tags um, in each zone as a resident. So your odds are, you know, could go up or down depending on, on where you're at. So, um, you know, the zone, the zone that we hunt, I think they issue 340 or 360, uh, 360 tags, five, 5,100 total tags in, in the province of New Brunswick get drawn for residents somewhere around that number. And those are allocated within the 25 zones. Um, so this year there was a it was just a little over 4100 uh, successful successful hunts uh, so basically every four to five people got their moose that that drew what are they the, yeah. what are these so if you if you live there do you have to go with a guide too or no. you can you can DIY it yeah yeah so then these no. okay so that's virtually how it is like in Maine and stuff, these guys like are trying to DIY it and they're running the roads. They've never called that a moose. And then, Mm. you know what I'm saying? So they're not like, like you guys are out there all the time. You're spending your whole lives just, just to find these moose. 
Yeah, I mean, when you put in for your tag, you're usually putting in for a zone that you you know or you've hunted before, your friends have hunted before, kind of thing. And and then you find out in July if you get your tags, you got a couple months to to really you know get out there and, and look around and uh, you know come up with a game plan for September. So, so I want to ask something about the calling, right? So when you're right. calling, because I'm so intrigued by it, honestly. Like, do you make your own cone out of the birch, or how do you how do you do it? I got a. I carry a whole bunch of calls on me, and uh, I do. I have I have some birch bark calls that I made, um, and then I has. Um, I like that for my cow call, and I have a, a, a Ken Kaplan fiberglass horn that I like. Um, it's just a thin resin fiberglass call that I like using for the bull grunt. It kind of gives it a nice little deep echo. Um, I like that one for bull grunting, and and then the moose shoulder blade. Uh, carry that with me, and then. You I'll start it we use my hands and uh, just as a like a low call to see if there's something really close but then I'll start reaching it with those horns and then uh, you know as the moose gets closer if they're responding and coming closer then I'll just put the put the horns away and just use my use my hands or whatever so one of the things that I so I was talking to a, a friend of mine actually who's He's, he's actually a pretty big moose hunter himself, but he was talking about how he takes the cone, like if he's near water or whatever, and he'll like mm. plug it on the top of the water to make it sound like they're walking. And then he said something else about taking water and put it in the cone, and you like let it drip so that it sounds like I'm urinating or whatever. I, yeah. did, I thought that was kind of cool, honestly. Was it, does that really add a huge effect to it, like the whole full circle? I think if you're if you're planning on calling a moose to the water's edge then then yeah i think that that technique might work mm -hmm. i don't personally do that um but i've i've seen people doing it and people that hunt ponds and lakes and things like that i could see where that would be effective like it you got to sound like a moose if you're doing it right and right and, and moose aren't quiet they don't uh, they're not like a bear that moose when they're coming they're making noise you hear them coming and uh you know they're breaking branches and stuff like that so when moose walks in water you can hear that for a couple hundred yards away when when they grunt back at you can you hear them like from from super far away like like they you because you had said before in your story that like you called at them and you could hear them from like 300 yards away like you can they really rip that that far yeah if it's quiet like no wind and cold i i've i've had responses from bulls that i know are six 600 yards away and <laughs> takes them a while to get to you and uh yeah you can really hear it's just this low low deep grunt that just echoes right you can you can really hear it and and their hearing's better than ours so they can hear your call from quite some distance yeah i mean the, the, those ones that you get those answers from that distance that you don't really hear anything until you let out a call and then you hear that response from way you know way out so it, it's pretty good. it doesn't sound like it's all that you know that that woo, woo, but it doesn't sound like it, you would be able to hear it from that far away because and i've never heard it you know what i'm saying so i don't know but i just can't believe that it travels that far i thought it, it was does. more like a course cro close quarters type thing but no you can hear it from a ways i had a pretty close encounter with the moose this spring up there while he was with the water but he didn't <laughs> he didn't grow <laughs> You licked your licked the bottom of your shoe, didn't he? He did. Yeah. <laughs> That's nuts. That's absolutely nuts. Oh, well, I'm so, glad that you guys had a really good season. That's 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 the best. That's Tyler, good. you've been on uh, quite a few moose hunts yourself, huh? Yeah, yeah. I was trying to remember back through. I don't know. I think the first moose hunt I went on was 2006. I might have missed a couple of years, but I'd say since at least 2008. 2009, I've, I've went pretty well every year with someone, whether it was a non-resident or, or a friend or just somebody locally that had a license and, um, you know, had, I, I just acquired gear over time. You learn something every year. There's a piece of gear that, uh, that you learn you may need, whether it's rope or pulleys or, or a portable wench or anything like that. So you just acquire gear over time as time goes on. Um, and and people, people in New Brunswick, like, if you look at the, I think there's 80,000 people apply every year residents for, for moose licenses. There's only like 35,000 deer tags that are, you know, people buy deer licenses. So you've got a lot of people that go moose hunting that really, really don't know anything about moose hunting or, or the gear that's required to get one out. Um, 
you know, we, we've, we've run into people driving around in the woods with, with guns and, you know, basically 50 feet of rope. Right. So unless he falls on the road, um, you're, you're going to be in trouble. You're not, uh, you're not quartering a moose and moving it out if you've never done it before. It's, it's, there's an art to it. So, you know, once, once you acquire some gear, people, people ask you and, and they look, you know, you get the gear to go and people learn every year a little bit. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Like I said, I've probably been going since consistently since 2008. So, so do you use like a chainsaw winch and not that kind of thing to like get them out? Uh, yeah, I've got one. Um, they work in the right setting. I've had bad luck with mine. Um, every time I go to use it, it doesn't seem, you know, we seem to have an issue with it. Um, I don't know if it's just operator error or if I got a dud. Um, but they, I've seen them used really effectively um, in tight spots or, or places where you would be with a chainsaw for, you know, two or three guys for a couple of hours to move a moose out. Um, there's also those those portable wenches with the rope. They they seem to be a little bit of a better rig. Um, there's there's no rehooking like a chainsaw wench. You got 150 feet of cable, so you've got to you you pull it in 150 feet. You've got to run that back out. So you've got to keep resetting and and moving. And uh, those portable wenches, you can just put a rope around it and you pull and it comes through. So it's it's a little bit more versatile in that sense. That's not, I, I don't know. Like what, what's an, I, I can't even imagine walking up to an animal like that. Like what well, we were talking to somebody last week about it. And like, <clears throat> even when you shoot a big buck, you get walk up to him, you roll him over, you prop him up and you get that, get him set all up nice for that good pitcher. But I, how do you even roll a moose over to get, to get the pitcher? <laughs> well, it, it, this year I'll say the moose fell completely perfect. I didn't have to prop his legs underneath him or anything. So it was easy, but it doesn't, doesn't normally happen like that. It takes a couple guys, even, even when you're field dressing them, you know, to get them over and hold over and right. Um, you know, a lot of times in the right, in the wrong spot, it'll take a couple guys to, to move them around. They're, they're big animal. Like all those bulls that we shot live weight would be, you know, 1100, 1200 pounds. So you're talking something that's, Probably four or five times the size of a big buck. I mean, it's 150 pounds, just its head and antlers. I mean, like, what do you, you know, like, that's no joke. Yes, we're interrupting your podcast. But be honest, wouldn't you rather be reeling in a big one at Sportsman's Paradise? At LouisianaCharterFishing.com, you can check captain availability, find nearby lodging, and book your trip. With hundreds of Louisiana Charter Boat Association guides, LouisianaCharterFishing.com makes it easy to plan your ideal trip, inshore or offshore, saltwater or freshwater. Book now at LouisianaCharterFishing.com. What are you waiting for? These fish aren't going to catch themselves. If you hunt enough, you learn the truth. What you seek speaks a language and knows it well. That's why every Primo's call for everything you hunt is made the right way. We sweat every detail so you get more out of every hunt and nothing leaves our hand until we know it'll work in yours because we don't just make the world's best calls we speak the language primos with ring cameras and doorbells it's easy to keep every fright in sight see who's there keep your scaredy cats company Oh, it's okay, sweetie. I'll be home soon. And protect your crypt from the real monsters. Oh, come on. The sign says take one. Find dead simple ways to stay connected right now at ring.com. That's crazy. All, all, your, all your questions, Steve, are going to be answered in about 345 days. <laughs> yeah. Kill me, buddy. I can't Steve, Steve you, guys, you guys better mess with them. Like, here, move this foot over here. Like, oh, no, no. You got to do. I'll be running the camera, man. I don't, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> oh, no. You're going to have to work whether you're following the camera or not. Like, you don't think that them boys ain't going to put you to work, Steve? You know what dad's going to say? He's going to go, bring the wrecker. <laughs> yeah, you have to bring the record. Oh, <laughs> uh, I can't wait, man. It's gonna be awesome. I wanted to come up this year so bad for that week, but you know, I'm glad I didn't because I, 
I'm looking forward to seeing it for the first time with my old man next year. A hundred percent, man. You know, I not yeah. having that prequel to it and kind of getting the full vibe for the first time with him next year. You know, mm-hmm. that's gonna be, be special. A, that be special. will be special. But uh, it's big bear mode now. That moose is over. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Except big buck mode now. Tyler, well, you've been chasing those little ditch chickens yet? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I got two actually. The opening day, and I haven't got any sense. So, I know, I know where your secret spot is. <laughs> yeah, Just good bird road. I'll tell you where to go. <laughs> we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna run a little, uh, a little guides tournament this weekend for for grouse out of the out of the camp on Saturday, potluck style, and weigh in at four o'clock. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> It's, twenty twenty dollar buy in for team the winner takes all out of the old snooze and booze yeah yeah <laughs> nice Tyler you getting in on that I am shooting all mine with a twenty two forty grain to get the weight up <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk about that a little bit because we talked about that pretty heavily last spring and that's yeah. uh, that's not very convention right that's not common is it. No, my dad told me a long time ago, he's, he's a hunts in the woods, you know, was a woods hunter. And he told me when I first started hunting, we'll just say my shooting was a bit to be desired. And, uh, he, we were hunting one day and he said, you know, you want to, you want to become a better shot. He said, start hunting grouse with a 22. And, uh, so I did. And he's right. Cause you got to pick your shot. Like you'll, you'll fire, you'll fire at birds with a 22 that you'll cartwheel with a 16 gauge and they'll run away with a 22 and you're sitting there shaking your head. Um, but you got, it really teaches you, you got to pick your shot and you got to shoot in the head. Like if you shoot them in the body, you make a mess. So it's, you know, head or neck in the tire, it's the size of your finger. So you're shooting at that maybe at 20 or 30 feet, 40 feet. Um, but it definitely makes you a better shot. Um, so I just started doing that probably three, four years ago and just continued on. Now it's kind of fun. So that's what I use to, to hunt them with. What That's you, awesome. What do you just hunt them? You hunt them like driving along and you see one hop out and just whack it and no grouse next cut. Yeah. No grouse next cut. Yeah. Yeah. I do that. I do a little bit of walking. Um, it all, it all depends. Like if you, can no, you find don't, it out. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't lie to the audience. <laughs> you don't do no, no walking. Do, do, I've, I've got a couple spots that are, that are secret holes. You, you've got to get out and walk, but, uh, I want to go there if I need birds. <laughs> <laughs> You're saving them for this uh, this shootout this weekend. Yeah, they're they're a bit away from that away from that though. So I'm gonna have to pull out some of my good bird roads. I'm not uh, I'm not sure of the plan yet here how this is gonna work, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what makes it fun, right? Yeah, that's awesome. What do, now? What are you expecting for a turnout, Bri? No, I think we've got I think we've got five teams so far. You know, it's just kind of a family deal where you know just invited everyone through their families and kids as a as a team and and uh, just kind of end the season with a pot luck and a little bit of fun you know yeah that's awesome we uh i don't think we did it last year but a couple of years back we we did a squirrel hunting competition yeah. and like, it was like january after deer season was over and i mean squirrel hunting is really not that big and this was this was nationwide this wasn't just local and um we did all kinds of fun prizes, like uh, lo- you know, longest squirrel from tip of the nose to the tip of the tail, and people were just out shooting squirrels and posting the pictures and measuring uh-huh. them, and oh, oh, that's twenty-one inch, that's twenty-one inches, that's a big squirrel there, you know, and it was pretty cool. We did it for like the whole month of January. Yeah, but the something. worst is we had the professional like squirrel hunting teams with their dogs get involved, and these guys are shooting forty of them in a month, and it it ended up becoming a. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more serious than we thought it was going to end up being, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. But it was fun. It was cool just to get people out there tr- trying to squirrel hunt that probably wouldn't had if it wasn't for us, you know, doing something like that. Yeah, right. for sure. I didn't realize how hard squirrel hunting was until I started the squirrel hunting competition, <laughs> and then I had to go out squirrel hunting. And I, and what you don't know is squirrel hunting, like the squirrel hunting rut is during deer season. Right, but when you do it after deer season, they're trying to hibernate because it's so damn cold. So there's really no squirrels around. <laughs> it's kind of a kind of a pain in the ass. But Steve, you got some antlers over there. You want to give them the old what rattles your antlers? I got a, I got Before a the... set right here. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, guys, why don't you tell us uh, what rattles your antlers in the outdoor field or guiding or whatever? What 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 kind of grinds oh. your gears? Go ahead, Tyler. For for me, it's all about getting out in the woods and and teaching or taking people that uh, maybe have never done it or are looking to get into it and, and seeing them. I was I was saying to Brian. Um, it's almost the, the feeling of watching someone else be, you know, a successful uh, harvest, a successful moose or a deer, or even if it's a grouse, that, that feeling I find now is more gratifying than actually, you know, pulling the trigger yourself. Um, that's, that's what really gets me going. And, and probably Brian will attest to this is deer. Like we, we see some deer on the trail camera and he's looking for moose pictures and I've got the whole camera piled up there looking at these deer and, and, and we're, we're moose scouting, but I'm, you know, I'm always interested in deer and big, big bucks in the woods. So, um, definitely whitetails get me going as well. How about you, Brian? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing drives me more nuts than letting Tyler look at trail cam pictures when we're scouting. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many times I've ripped a laptop out of his hands this, this summer, but. Why? Cause just, he's looking it, at it, big it, bucks. Like, oh, it's, it's a, this is a monster buck. I'm like, Tyler, it's a four point. Give me the frigging computer. <laughs> You know, well, it's four yeah. Point, yeah. <laughs> come to think about it, I remember being up that that week. I was up there turkey hunting when I ran those baits with you guys. Yeah. I don't remember the name of the real stand, but you remember we nicknamed it Little Bear. Yeah. yeah. And I remember we came, we pulled that card, and we got back to the truck, and you were you were saying that the uh, laptop wasn't working. Mm-hmm. Now, now I'm wondering, maybe the laptop was working. You just didn't want Tyler to see what was on the <laughs> card. <laughs> Good chance. <laughs> Good chance. <laughs> what, what is a big deer up there? Like, do they have a lot of big deer? Or is it like Maine where they're far and few between? No, we got, we got, we got a good population of whitetails here, big bucks, you know. You know a, a big buck to us is, you know, we get them in that 200 plus pound range weight wise and you know deer get shot here from anywhere from 100 inches to you know up to 150s 160s you know yeah. that and uh it's if you want to if you they're here they're right. here for sure yeah you just gotta hunt yeah. them hard right they're not yeah. they don't come every day yeah <laughs> yeah like a 130 inch plus deer here like a rack wise is pretty respectable deer like most most deer that are shot in New Brunswick are way you know and than hundreds or 110 but so you got 130 you got a nice one you get them 140 150 you got a really nice one anything bigger than that you get a monster i mean that's anywhere though really i mean that's the same here that's the same even in the midwest right i mean like that's a 130s 140s i you don't can't shake a stick at that i mean that's a good deer Mm -hmm. anywhere i just didn't know like 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 northern maine and stuff they don't shoot a lot of big antler deer you know what i'm saying they're more that body chasing that two right and Sim- similar here like a like a lot of those big woods bucks are big bodies but you know six and eight points that would be a hundred inches not you know 100 110 inches the odd the odd one you'll get you know a nice rack but a lot of those big woods bucks are are you know big bodies but don't have a lot of rack to them so talking rack wise you better start it, another podcast you got them going <laughs> so, uh, in new brunswick would you call it a 10 by 10 pointer or a five by five 10 point and then are they brow tines or eye guards brow tines okay all right we're on the same 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 (laughs) same same uh latitude line but more to the west it's a it's a four by four and it's eye guards for some reason i don't know why what it is like where the variations like changes but for some reason I, it drives me nuts because my buddy would be like, oh, it's a four point. I'm like, no, it has eight points. That's not a four point. No, it's four by four. That drives me nuts. Nuts. Yep. I get so mad about it. <clears throat> well, so you ready for deer season, though, Ty, or what? No, I'm just kind of winging it this year. I, I haven't even put any cameras or anything out yet, but uh, I've got – Got three week, two and a half, three weeks off. You know, the last little bit in muzzleloader, so I'm going to put some put some serious uh, time in the woods and hope for a little bit of snow. And uh... well, boys, we appreciate you guys the pictures of you guys when uh, when you guys go to your moose camp. Before we cut you loose, you guys want to just tell tell them and check everybody guys out. 
Yeah, so something we have a, our website's uh, williamsoutfitters.ca. Um, we're on Facebook, Williams Woods and Motor Outfitters. You can you can check out or follow us on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, send us a message if you got any questions or or anything like that, and and uh, we can go from there. Fantastic, guys! Can't thank you guys enough. Good luck uh, on your trip. Good luck this weekend at your uh, uh, little grouse hunting competition you got going on. And as yep. always. Thanks for taking the ride right here on the Outdoor Drive. Thanks, boys. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it.